Welcome to Leading Agile Sound Notes. This is the first podcast Jessica and I have done since I lost a bet to her and I owe her $10, which I will give to her whenever our paths cross. And it is also the first podcast since she's been able to wear this shirt and tell us about being a hungry dog. So what happened? Why are you wearing that shirt? Well, just in case you missed it, the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl! <laughs> I won't break out into the fight song, I promise, but I might do a little E A G L E S Eagles. All right. Wow. So, just to represent, we've got the Cunningham on. I have been a fan since I started watching Cunningham, which was the early 90s. That's, I didn't really understand football then, but I did watch him in the vet. We had season tickets. I was born and bred for this, and we are excited with the Super Bowl win. And I That's swore off them before you even started watching them, but I was pretty excited too. That was very cool. It was very exciting to see that they won and very exciting to see. To me, my favorite part was watching Jason Kelsey's speech dressed up like a mummer because I had to explain what that was to my kid. But I'm always trying to find really good examples of like the perfect use of expletives. And that speech <laughs> with, with hundreds of thousands of people, just that ocean of people, like I'm thinking like from, you know, like toddlers through grandparents, they're all just chanting expletives along with them. I thought that was a perfect representation of Philadelphia, which was really nice to see. So it's go so Eagles. funny because I agree with you. I'm so conflicted about like the new song. Um, we won't have to talk about it. But I've been trying to remove curse words from my vocabulary. I'm like, I can find a more intelligent word, but there's nothing better than that. And we'll leave you know what? I, I will pick can't up find the a better slack. way to say it. You can eliminate them. <laughs> I'll pick up the slack. I'll make up the difference for you happily. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So All I right. don't think this podcast is about the Eagles, though, right? No, no. We're going to talk about <laughs> distributed teams. So I just started teaching in Pittsburgh. Last week was my first uh, set of classes in Pittsburgh, which was awesome. And I would like to thank all the people that came out. And there was a woman in the class um, that was very patient the whole way through. She was the only one who was like deeply worried about distributed teams. And so she had a couple questions at the end of the class. I said, listen, you know, I've, I know people that work with distributed teams. Um, and I've done a lot of work with distributed teams. Why don't you send me some questions and we'll use them in a podcast. And you've done a good bit of work with distributed teams as well, correct? Absolutely. Most of the work that I've done has been with distributed teams. All actually, right. I haven't had the luxury of having them all in one all spot. In space. Okay. So I'm going to read the question. We've got two. I don't know if we'll have time to get through both, but we'll try. They're, they're fairly lengthy questions. All right. This is take four. I'm going to paraphrase the question because it's written sort of, it's a great explanation, but it doesn't flow so well. And I keep stumbling when I try to read it. So this person has a scrum master in one location or had a scrum master that is located with a couple team members. And there's a couple development members that are spread around. There are two product owners working on this particular product, and they are also remote. When the scrum master who was working with the team before was located with the majority of the team, that person got to spend a lot of time locally with the team. Obviously, that's a better way to do things. And we know there's also challenges when you've got multiple product owners. Part of the team was remote, so the remote parts of the team were encouraged to participate via video. All the ceremonies were held with some sort of electronic medium. But this person who took my class is the new scrum master for this team. The old scrum master has moved on to another project, and she is remote. So she is a fully remote scrum master. She's got team members you know, in multiple parts of the country now, some who used to have a scrum master locally with them. And she's wanting to know what she can do to be able to be a good scrum master or what, thing, what steps she can take to help her in the role of scrum master with a fully remote team. Do you think, did I do a good job with the question? I think you did a great job. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that validation. Okay, so... What kind of suggestions do you have? Like, have you have you had that situation, Jessica? And what what kind of suggestions or tips do you have for for Tara? Yes, so I've had the same exact situation. Um, well, I shouldn't say exact because I feel like there's so much, and I'm reading it on my other screen. My eyes are diverting. <laughs> um, I, I it there's so much left that I would love to ask. Right, so we're I'm going to go into this with some assumptions. 
Okay. Um, and I'm going to use my own experience as those assumptions. So one of the clients that I had worked at, um, one of my previous clients, they had teams not just in the United States, but also in other countries. And I wasn't necessarily the scrum master, but there was not scrum masters on this team. I was supposed to coach the team. So on how to do scrum, because they didn't know that yet either. Um, okay. And with teams in multiple time zones, um, in India and other countries, um, it, it, it was actually a lot of fun and challenging. But here's the problem, right? Um, when you have a team, one team, where some of the team is remote and then some of the team, and I'm talking about developers, not necessarily product owners, scrum masters, um, people who are actually working on stuff to um, execute on the sprint. Um, and some of the teams together, it really does not help establish your team norms. And it makes it very challenging. So, for instance, if your entire team is remote, it makes it so much easier because you have your team norms about what it's like to uh, collaborate with each other. Now, when you have four devs who are all working together, when they collaborate, typically, they're going to do it on the fly. And a lot of times, they're going to forget about the other three devs. Okay. They're just going to, hey, let's problem solve. Let's do this. And it becomes a challenge because they've made a decision. They've yeah. moved forward. They may not document it in a system because they had a conversation. And then you have these other people who aren't part of that that group that don't know what's going on. And then so you end up does, with this kind of sub-team mindset, even though you don't want it. Right. Okay. Exactly. Um, okay. Now, I've seen it work really well when everybody's remote because you have the same team norms. Now, it's funny because as somebody who's kind of managing from a higher level, yeah. um, I love it when that happens because they're using the tool and I can aggregate data, right? And I'm like, oh, look, guys, look how good you're doing. Look, how, look at things, right? Because like, you're using the tool to actually communicate what's going on, where right. I find that that happens less when everybody's together and it's not necessarily bad. They just don't have all the details in there. They just move the cards, if you will, and you have your estimates. It's not necessarily okay. because they've had conversation about it where you're forced to document those things when everybody's remote. Um, takes more time to do that. So just giving you two, uh, a few different aspects of pros and cons. Um, the scenario that this person has, they have one team that has seven people with two POs and one scrum master. Yeah. If there is an ability, and it looks like they also have multiple projects assigned to this one. Well, team. we'll get to that one in a second. Let's, right. That's, that's a whole other nightmare. Yeah, we'll get to that. Nightmare. Right. It kind of ties in a little bit with what my what I feel like an ideal scenario could be, right? Okay. So let me assume that these are full stack devs, okay? So they have all of the skill set. I'm, I'm doing happy path. All of the skill sets possibly needed um, on the team that they all have that. Right. So I would wait, hang on one second before you go on. Can you just in case there's anybody that doesn't totally get it? Can you explain full stack developer? Oh, OK. So a full stack developer. When I'm talking about full stack, I'm not talking about um, just knowing how to code different languages. Right. Some people okay. consider that, you know, full stack. What I'm also talking about is um, somebody who can perform all of the. I want to say this right, all of the roles on okay. the team effectively well, T shaped, right? So you can, you have the ability to do testing, you have the ability to uh, release products, so you know your DevOps skills, uh, you have the ability to uh, potentially do some some wireframes, although I, I hope the product owner kind of gets and some, more of some too. database work as well. You can do back end, right? yeah. Exactly. Okay. You know how to do database work. You can create APIs, right? So you kind of have your T-shapes. You may not, you may have your, your best in a certain area and your preference, but you can really dabble in all of it, right? Okay. Um, Thank you. So my assumption is that they're all T-shaped. We know that's okay. probably the case, okay, so let's, let's go with that, right? So my recommendation on this one is the three devs who are remote and the one, one PO that's one feature team, not component team, feature team. These people hopefully can do everything that they need to do to compose a sprint. Right? Okay, so, so you're saying you split the team up. Kind of, yeah, and then the four people who are together, because as it is, they also have multiple projects. So having them with the multiple projects, it makes a challenge. Now, I'm assuming... But right, wait, wait, but wait. 
Hold on. Hold right. on. This poor person just took my class and had me rail on her for two days about how they can only be one scrum master per team. Okay, let's get to that. To let's that have an point. argument. Yes. So I agree. <laughs> okay. But she, does she have right? So, and this is actually what I I loved to do with the, the team scenario that I uh, was talking about before. Does okay. the scrum master have to be an individual role? Can somebody from the team rise into that role? Oh, okay. So it, it's interesting because Derek and I have this thing where we're not going to use the word interesting. Sorry, I had to stop there. It's an interesting. Um, so it's very challenging because as a scrum master, when you come in and your job is to be the scrum person, make sure they're doing scrum, make sure they know scrum, Right. Um, if we go back, and um, this is something that Mike had said in a previous podcast, if we go back to, you know, when Scrum was originated, is that really how they saw Scrum Masters, right? I don't think that that okay. it was a different role. It had to be someone who's on the team who can actually remove uh, dependencies and impediments and things of that sure. sort and really manage that stuff, right? So okay. if we go back to the origination and um, potentially what this person could be doing, because also if we look at Scrum, really a good Scrum Master is one Scrum Master per team, right? Okay. So if you're multiple teams, you kind of need to take a step back and allow someone else to take on the, the, the I would say, lead um, from a Scrum Master perspective. So okay. the teams that I had that were remote, instead of coming in and saying, okay, I'm the Scrum Master and I'm going to lead the daily Scrum, I would say, all right, uh, I'm here just to make sure that you guys understand what a daily Scrum is, but you guys are going to lead this. Like, go ahead, bring, somebody else share your screen, bring okay. up the... The, your scrum board we're going to walk the board from right to left and go from there and if there's any questions or if they're getting into a deep dive i'll we'll say you know hey guys you know just remember not what scrum says so you're teaching them to kind of function as two independent teams with one scrum master that's kind of like an uber scrum master almost like two separate kanban teams yeah like they have a coach who yeah. is there but so then kind of I don't necessarily, I like to let people rise to the occasion of like the lead. I almost yeah. call them a team lead. Like that's sure. what I've done in the past. Now, it doesn't have to be that way, but allowing the team to own it because what happened, what I've seen so much and I was guilty when I first started was I wanted to run the team, right? I'm yeah. the scrum master and I'm going to run the daily scrum and I'm going to call on you and you're going to tell me what you're doing. That's not how it was meant to be, right? That's not what like, it's for, yeah. Yeah. It's not like, like you're not in charge, lady, <laughs> calm down. Um, so really taking the step back and allowing to coach the team and letting someone emerge in that scrum master role, you're still right. the coach. So you're taking that next step back, if you will. Okay. That, so I want to, I want to, oh, good. Sorry. That, I was gonna say, that's what I recommend when you have two teams, whether they're remote or not. Okay. So I want to ask you a question because there's one thing that I've done that I'm not sure if it. I think it's it's a leftover for me being a project manager, and I don't know if it's something that help, helps or hurts. So as a scrum master with the remote members, if if I see that people aren't fully connected, then one thing I've done is I will take I will make an extra effort to reach out to that person um, and spend some time on the phone with them or chatting with them online every day. Maybe not necessarily project related, but just trying to make sure that bridge is open and that they have that connection and some some way of, you know, connecting. Um, it does create a one on, you know, one on one path between me and the individual. I'm not sure it so much fosters a connect stronger connection to the team. So I'm wondering if if you've seen that help or, or maybe all that's really doing is making me feel like better about it and not really helping the team. Um, probably all of the above. Okay. <laughs> you know, right. you know what I mean? Um, I'll say that one thing that I don't like to do is take up any, and, and this is just the introvert in me. I yeah. don't like to take up anyone's time for things that could be deemed unnecessary, like relationship building. And it's so important, right? Like, yeah. like you should be relationship building. So one thing that um, is so important when you have a remote team is having an online um, way to communicate like a room um, such as Slack or hit chat, like that you can have your team rooms where you can communicate about things. Um, even just kind of shooting the shit a little bit, you know, going, yeah. 
I, I didn't mean to curse. See that? Look, it just the <laughs> Philly just creeps out. You can't even just embrace it. Embrace that, John. Sure. Yes, yes. Then I'll be drinking my sparkling water. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, so from the standpoint of I don't necessarily set up. Well, initially when I go start a team, I definitely set up one on one because I want to understand the dynamics what they think are important, where are the areas that they feel like they need to maybe, um, they want to continue to improve. What are their end goals? I want to know kind of what is their motivation and like, is this your end game or is this, where do you want to be? Right. I look at it more from like a, like I want to empower people to reach their full potential type thing. Okay. Um, And then let them know that the door is always open if they ever want to have those one-on-one sessions with me. Now, are you pretty I, direct yeah. about it in retrospectives, like with the team saying, look, I, we need to spend time each time talking about how we're connecting. I mean, are you pretty overt about that or do you wait for them to bring it up? I wait for them to bring it up. It will depend. Okay. Actually, it depends. So um, it's been a while since I, I've uh, been a scrum master, but I do remember those old days. Um, <laughs> so in running the retrospectives, really I like to guide it in a way where I'll put things up there. Um but if it's important they vote on it. Right. So like, okay. like I always make it a consensus. Like I'm gonna put things up there that, you know, I'm gonna say, hey, these are some things that I'm seeing. I could be wrong. My perspective might be different. You guys may right. say, nope, not an issue. But if we move it forward to discuss it in a more elaborate way, it's based on the votes of the team. Okay. Cool. So if they think it's important, then that's the case. Otherwise it's not important enough for them to talk about right now. So I will say though, there has been scenarios where I've seen there's kind of conflict and I have individuals reached out to people like, Hey, you know, is everything going on? But I usually would do it initially on like, like it's like a direct message. Like, Hey, you know, like, I don't know. Maybe it's like I said, the introvert in me, but these are remote teams. Right. So I haven't always had the luxury of having people right there. So I've had to, use uh technology in order to bridge these gaps um and it's the same way with kind of being in consulting with what derek and i are doing a lot of it's remote so we have to pay more attention to uh, other cues that something different might be going on because we're not face to face all the time okay Um, now do you have um any any games or techniques for fostering more of a kind of a collaborative spirit? Like one of the things that I'm trying to, to, to figure out with remote teams is how do you get them to socialize as a team? I mean, you can have a face to face, right? Cause that's a great way for all of like when we all reconnect, but when you don't have that, you need other ways to build that bridge. And I'm wondering if there are games or activities or, or things that you've done or have seen work to build that bridge. And I'm also curious to hear if, if there are, from an introvert perspective, how you approach that stuff. As a sibling. <laughs> um, so it's, it's interesting because with remote games, yeah. it makes it more challenging to play games, right? Because you don't have like, you know, I'm not going right. to build a set of toothpicks and things like that. Um, so a lot of what I've done is more around getting them together to actually problem solve what we're doing and allowing it to foster naturally in that way. And I hate, I know it sounds so boring, right? But really having team meetings together, talking about silly things like a SpaceX launch. Um, actually, the one company I was at, that was like their biggest thing that they all connected on was like space travel. And I'm like, okay, we're going to talk about that um, before we do sprint planning, right? Okay. <laughs> so, so some social conversation-y type fun topic that everybody's interested in yeah so one thing i i tried um that was a little bit different um because we were all remote and we ended up going back to retrospectives but um this team was actually really close-knit so i don't think they needed the extra but what we did was we looked at um rock i don't know if you um um have read the book traction um but so they talked they talk about like quarterly rocks, like big goals that you have, right, for your team. And, not, and not then Dwayne from there, the Rock like, Johnson. Yeah, like not the Rock, that guy. Sorry. <laughs> I heard he might be running for president. <laughs> I'll vote for him. He announced it on Ellen or something. Yeah, but anyway, uh, different rock. <laughs> okay, so the big rocks. 
Yeah. So these are like, like your rocks of your quarter of like, you know, I want to, I think the team needs to get better at um, test driven development. Right. Okay. So they collaborate around that and like, okay, what does that look like? How do we break that down into objectives and measurable goals? Right. So we did a little bit of that on one of the remote teams I did that I worked with. And when okay. they got through kind of like learning that they actually built it into um, their backlog instead. Okay. So they're like, we don't really need to. So like a goal for, for the team. team. Yeah. Okay. I, I yeah. totally agree with you in the work thing. I find that I'm pretty introverted too. And, and for me, I enjoy getting to know people through work, like through working together. That's more fun to me than just being like, here, you people be social now. I just, I can't do that. And, and it's, it's always a struggle. Um, yeah. The other thing that you can do um, is, and it's something that we try to do at Leading Agile is having like gatherings, right? Where if there's a time where you can come together, if you're going to start like um, a new area of your product, maybe everybody getting together, um, doing some story mapping, um, journey maps, things like that, so you can understand really what the product vision is. So if everyone can get together in one space for that, and then maybe have like some dinners at that point while you're all together for like five days, um, okay. that can really help. It's almost like a like a work vacation for them, you know, because so, so they're with their family and yeah, and then they can just totally focus on hanging out and. And getting to know each other better. I have two suggestions too. And so one of them is the book club, like the book club that it kind of goes and fits and starts to leading Andrew, but that has been a great way for me to get to know some other people and to dig into stuff and build some skills that I don't think I would be necessarily pursuing otherwise. That's been really helpful. Mm -hmm. And um, also at, at leading Andrew, this is, we used to have tribes a long time ago and the tribe that I'm in, we kind of maintained it. And we have a personal accountability team. So once every two weeks, we have a call where we all set goals and we check in with each other. And the idea is that we are supportive and hold each other accountable for the goals that we commit to one another. Um, so that has been a great way for me to connect. I don't know if that would work so well directly with one team because it's so much closeness, but um, it's something to consider as well. Um, or video games online, anything like that. Um, there's lots of other things that people can do, you know, collaboratively. I think the Slack thing is really big, but I've never, that's not my deal. So I don't gravitate towards that, but it helps, right? Yeah. A lot of people. Yeah. The one thing I don't, I'm not as familiar with all the different like plugins of uh, uh, Slack, but with HipChat, sometimes the developers would like build their own stuff to plug into the chat room and then randomly have these upvotes and like just like random, like, like somebody has like a, like a, a happiness score and like, they would make oh, these cool. things like like I, I, I remember they they would geek out on stuff like that and it would actually foster communication with them within hip chat because they were coming up with these things that no one knew of and all of a sudden someone would like do like a, a thumbs up and then to, to like somebody's thing like what they would write and then all of a sudden yeah. it would be like oh this person has this many points now <laughs> like oh, that's what cool. happened <laughs> um but so silly, silly fun stuff can go a long way with distributed teams. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, cool. But the key, like I said, is if you're going to have distributed teams and you're going to have people who also work together, but there's other people who aren't working um, in the same located space, you really have to be disciplined around your team norms because in, you're inevitably going to be leaving people out. and. Yeah. Uh, number one, it's not fun for them, but number two, you're missing out on their talent when you do that. Well, and it can be really easy for somebody to go from being slightly disconnected to being kind of, I don't want to work here anymore. Um, and you don't want to lose people that way either. So, so definitely reach out and try to pull them back in whenever you can. Right. And that's something I'll bring to the attention of the team. If they're doing a retrospective, like, okay, you guys are really great. How do we bring that that um, that energy into the remote team? Yeah, cool. All right, this was great. So, if if Tara or anybody else wants to get in touch with you and ask you more questions about this, what is the best way for them to reach you? Well, Tara should reach out to me about the TSS questions she had that we didn't get to because we have a solution for you. <laughs> um, so until next time, um, but in the meantime, she can reach out to me at Jessica dot wolf w-o-l-f-e at okay. leadingagile.com 
Um, and then on Twitter at the Jessica Wolf. I've been a little bit more active on that lately. So cool. All right, and I'll I'll make sure we include all that in the show notes. And thank you for the question. If anybody who's watching or listening has questions you'd like us to answer, just send them to Dave at leadingagile.com. We're always looking for any way we can help. So any kind of question, um, we'll be happy to take on. Thanks a lot for watching, and go Eagles. Go Eagles.